Assalamu alaikum rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam. Welcome to another episode. Those of you at home and those of you who are here in the studio of the series Dawa Ilallah. And we have so far been building the framework that makes up what is permissible in the work of calling people to Islam. We haven't come up with our own ideas. We've been basing this on the work by a author who wrote the book Dawa Ilallah. And he has strictly confined himself to the Quran and the Hadith. He hasn't come up with his own ideas. It's not a book of techniques. So we're not going to be teaching you tricks. We're not going to be teaching you the way Jehovah Witnesses would teach their people and say to them, well, if they ask this question, this is how you answer it. It is situational. Dawah is situational. It changes from person to person, situation to situation. So I'm not going to teach you to paraphrase things or to speak like a parrot or to just come up with the clever answer. You have to look at it from a situational point of view. People can see when you're being fake. When you speak to a Jehovah Witness and you ask him a question that he has not been trained to answer, he looks like a deer at a headlamp when the lights are driving at night and you see an animal jumps in front, it freaks out and gets knocked over by the car. That's what they like. So we don't like that. We're not going to teach you techniques. But some of the ideas of doing dawah may seem technique-y. They might seem like techniques. But I'm not going to teach you techniques that is traditional that you'll find in a number of dawah courses. It's the same when you go to university. They say 10% of what you learn here you're going to use in your real life. So that means 90% is just really giving you the background. Only 10% of what you're going to use. It's quite scary, actually. So we're going to deal with a bit of methodology of dawa, And we are going to deal with what seems to be technique, but it's not technique. Because technique, is, like we said, doesn't really work in the real world. When you actually take it out there, unless you've got a big camera in the face of the person that you're about to talk to on the street and you're sticking a mic in their face, then technique works because the person just wants to get rid of you. And they will say anything it takes to get rid of you, like a salesman. If a salesman comes to you in the shop and he says, wouldn't you like to buy it? Wouldn't you like? Wouldn't you like? Wouldn't you like? Over and over and over. Eventually you say, yes, okay, I'll take the product. What do you do? As soon as you get down the other aisle, you take the product out and you put it on the shelf and you carry on walking because you just wanted to get rid of the salesman. So you took whatever he was selling. And then as soon as he was out of sight, you just took it out of your basket or you took it out of your trolley and you left it on the side. You see it all the time. I see it all the time. Go through shopping centers, you see like a piece of meat lying where the hardware section is, and you see hardware stuff sitting, over, and you know for sure there was a salesman there. That's why they've just relocated. They found they've relocated themselves around the shop. So there are a number of different ways that we can do dawah, and this is what we're going to be discussing today, inshallah. There are different styles of doing dawah, different ways that we can do dawah. Dawah is not just two dimensional, it's not just flat. There are many ways of doing Dao. What are some of the ways that those of you here in the studio, and maybe some of you at home can be thinking that we can do Dao? Anybody have a suggestion? You pick up the microphone, and if anyone else wants to talk, then just raise your hand and it will be sent to you afterwards. So what are some of the, the ways we can do Dao? At our workplace, when we meet with our friends, non-Muslims, we can do Dao over there. So at the workplace, when you meet your friends or your colleagues or your workmates, that's one way of doing dawah. We call that one-on-one -on -one dawah, one-to-one. -one. You and me sitting together, having a cup of coffee, having some tea, maybe standing around the vending machine. That's the place to do one-on-one -on -one dawah. And that one-on-one -on -one dawah can be done all over. It doesn't have to only be done in the workplace. It can be done in school, college. We are actually right now doing one-on-one -on -one dawah, even though millions of people around the world are watching. I am in your lounge or I'm on your laptop and you are interacting with me and I'm doing dawah one-to-one. -one. Unless there's a group of you all collected and coming around the laptop or sitting in the lounge, then it's not one-to-one. -one. So 
This is a preferred way, as far as I am concerned, on doing that. From my perspective, and the history of doing Dawa, which is an 11-year history, I have found that one-on-one -on -one Dawa is far more effective. One, it's more personal. You can get to know the person better. One-on-one -on -one Dawa tends to take longer. You need to be more sensitive on one-on-one -on -one Dawa. So you've got to see when the person starts to fidget. This is where body language becomes so important. When you start to see the person starting to look around, look at his watch, fiddle with his shoes, feel his heartbeat, taking his pulse, then you know you've probably spoken too long. So you look for the first sign of fidgeting. One in one dawa should come to the end. So don't wait, like, in a classroom like this, the minute I see someone going like this, then I know, time to stop. If I start seeing people on their cell phones or they're busy doing something else, then I know that I'm not getting my message across and I stop. Even with public lectures, public talks, some people say, no, when you're doing a public lecture, that always happens. That's not acceptable to me. If there are a thousand people there and two people are starting to fidget, then there are at least another hundred people that want to do the same thing, but they're just smiling because they don't want to be caught fidgeting. So you've lost already a lot of people. So once you have two or three people already starting to lose interest and you're doing a public lecture, time to you for you to either stop or to change the tone that you're speaking in or to start bringing in some more stories or something to wake them up. Because if you're plodding along and plodding along and you're starting to lose people along the way, there are hundreds of others that are also losing along the way. So you want to engage people the whole time. That's very, very important on one on one dawa. Look for the telltale signs of boredom. Do not keep talking because they're not listening. What's another way of doing dawa? Anybody else? Online dawa by sitting behind a computer. Okay. By chatting. Online dawa is very, very useful. But there are a lot more don'ts than do's on online dawa. Online dawa requires a lot of good character from you from you. So be very cautious. Online dawa can be done mostly through social networks. Hardly websites are going to become obsolete. This is my personal view and opinion of technology. I had a computer when I was like yeha, tiny, before anyone else even had a computer, personal computer. I just happened to have parents that were in the right thing. So I've always been with technology. And I can tell you Websites are a thing of the past. They are going to be obsolete. No one's even going to be bothered going to a website. There is new technology, which is probably old technology by the time this is aired, where you have a virtual person who reads your website to you. So you switch your computer on, you go to the website, so you go to peacetv.tv, and then a virtual figure of Dr. Zaki and Art will come up on the screen, and he will do the talking. You won't go screening through everything, and he'll tell you about what you would have read on their website. And he'll walk you through the website. He'll build a little virtual Dr. Zaki and I walking through, and other scholars. Like you see sometimes when you're watching the news and you see those little figures coming up on the side of the screen, little people interacting, telling you about a program that's coming up. But that's the way websites are going. Plus, there's a lot more technology coming than that as well. So when we're using social media, that will be around for a long time to come. It's just another way of using a mobile phone. It's just now digital, where people are writing texts and sending videos and things like that. So that is the most effective way of using the internet. More effective than the websites, but that's why I said to you the other day, create a website, because it gets you into thinking about working on the internet. So the internet is extremely important to use as a tool for DAWA, but you're mostly going to be using social networks. No matter how we can say, Facebook is haram, and YouTube is haram, and Twitter is haram, and all the rest of it. If we all get off those social medias, that just means more space for the Christians to get on, or the atheists, or the agnostic. So don't leave, stay. In fact, invite more on there. The more Muslims, the better. Then we can move them out, and we move in. That's the way to do it. So. Social networks, like I said, are very, very important. However, there is big howevers on this. You have to be very strict. I have a strike one policy on my social networks. 
What does that mean? You know they have in strike one, strike two, strike three, you're out. Like sports. I don't have a strike three, it's a strike one. The first time you do something that is against the policies that I have written on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, it's already written there. So when you want to join, there's a whole thing that comes up and it says, do you want to join? This is what I believe. This is what I stand for. This is what I accept. Even if you're a Christian, even a Muslim, I spend more times defriending Muslims than non-Muslims. So you have a strike one policy. Certain things will not be tolerated. You can argue with my theological points of view. You can do that. But once you start talking about personal issues, click and you're blocked. That's forever. Not unfriend, blocked forever. So you can't come back again. So you have to be very strict. No time for playing games. So you can still have a social network, because that's what it means social being socializing, talking nicely to people, but very, very strict. So the minute it moves out of the perimeter of whatever you've designed it for, not acceptable. So when they ask you, how's your kids? How's your wife? Click. It's not what it's for. It's only there for a specific purpose. It should say that in your policy. So you should have, if you've got a fan page or whatever it is, even if it's just about who you are as a person, have a very strict policy. Scientific notions in the glorious Quran are among its endless aspects that can testify for the divine nature of this noble book. These scientific notions are probably the best addressed to the people of our time. I am Zaghloul al najjar Please join me in this program to discuss some aspects of the scientific notions in the glorious Quran. I created the universe to appreciate the word to word authenticity of scientific notions and proven facts mentioned in the glorious Quran 1400 years ago in Scientific Notions in the Glorious Quran every Saturday at 8 p.m. and repeat telecast at 8.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. Marriage or divorce? What's Islamic ruling? Nikah. Solution or problem? Heaven or hell? Uh, that is a misconception. You choose. Beauty, wealth, family status, virtue. Decide what you want. Decide your choice. Be sad or be happy. It's your choice. Join Dr. Zakir Naik in Better Half or Bitter Half tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 9.30 a.m. UK on Peace TV. He faces... He listens. My question is about the beard. About Imam Mahdi. What are the people believing? He answers. So number one is the help of Allah. He satisfies in the light of glorious Quran and authentic hadith. If Allah helps you believe me, you have to get something. Catch Dr. Zakir. Then we have the next call, please. To get convincing and valid answers in Dial Dr. Zakir, next on Peace TV. Second thing, 
you need to put a clause in there that protects you from being penalised or being prosecuted by the local government of your country or external governments of other countries. So it must state that this information cannot be used by any legal organisation against you. This is the opinions and the views of those people who have joined your organisation or joined your chat room or whatever it is. Because it can be used against you in a court of law and you can go to jail and you can be prosecuted. So even though you might think it's Facebook, it's Twitter, it's YouTube, it's whatever it is, all the social networks are, you can be prosecuted. So you have to put that in the statement that if anyone poses a question, undercover policeman, undercover investigator, it cannot stand up in a court of law because they didn't expose themselves as an undercover agent. So it's there to protect yourself. So this is something at home that you must be aware of. So the internet and social media and all the rest of it, very, very important, but there are um, restrictions that you're gonna have to put in place. You have to be cautious to protect yourself. Open it up and have specific rooms. Like you'd have, like in your home, you'd have different rooms for different things. So if you want to have a platform on Facebook, then have four or five platforms. I have about four Facebook profiles, because it gets quite confusing for people. Because they say, but I joined you and you never answer my questions. Because that's on a different platform with a different room, meaning a different thing. So I have one that's specifically for this, another one that's specifically for that. I have a fan page. So you don't get them mixed up. So this one you may have a little bit more tolerance because this is where you're doing more comparative issues. So people can like, be insulting and they'll get away with it. Or another one is not like that. So it's important that when you're doing your things that you have separation, you separate them. So if somebody wants to bring a comparative issue into say your DAWA section, you say, sorry, this is not the right platform, go to such and such a place. Because maybe these people here are already for Islam. They've already been fixed, and they're really right in the right state of mind to embrace Islam. You don't want someone coming in and causing a whole lot of problems all over again and start all over again two years' worth of work down the drain. So many of the people that revert to Islam through Facebook with me or that have helped to take Shahada, they're on a separate Facebook page. They're not on the same one, even though they're all Arab Islams. They are separate accounts. So we, that's important to do. You will only discover this through time. So whatever it is, use the internet, extremely powerful, magnificent tool to use. Hundreds of people every year take shahada that I personally come across have come through the internet. So do not underestimate it. More than one and one with me, more than group talks, more than public lectures. And it's a medium that only we are now starting to realize how powerful it is. Only that's why you see more and more people doing webinars. It's becoming very, very popular now. That more and more Muslims, instead of doing seminars, doing public lectures, doing big campaigns, they're just having webinars. And it's very easy. Any other ideas of way we can do that? Let's go to the top there first. While uh, traveling in a bus or a train, one can even, you know, hold a book, okay, uh, in order that the other person who's standing beside you can also see. And this helps to build a positive impact about Islam if ever they read that book. And this also happens sometimes. I try it. Yeah, and it good. also helps in beginning a conversation sometimes. Very, very good point. Very valid point and one that I use quite a lot. It's a very successful, easy, non-evasive way of doing dawah. You stand there and you have an Islamic book, especially if you're sitting on a bus, a book on maybe. But you have to be careful of the topics that you choose. You don't want to have something heavy that somebody's reading over your shoulder. It must be very light stuff. So one of my favorite books that I always carry on, I've read it a few hundred times over. It's called, Have You Discovered Its Real Beauty? Beautiful book written by a Saudi scholar. It's called, Have You Discovered Its Real Beauty? I can't remember the scholar's name. Well, he's not a scholar, he's just a general, uh, just a man who loves Islam. And it's a beautiful green cover, beautiful glossy pages with a little picture, and then it's got this lovely text. And Really good to read, nice, bold writing, beautiful. The whole thing is high quality, the whole thing. So when you open it and you're reading it, people look over your shoulder and they go, oh. So it's a soft way of doing dawah. Now, my friend and myself, we've taken this to another level. Instead of coincidentally leaving a book lying around or opening a book in front of people, we have conversations about Islam. So we will say, I'll say, 
Bilal, did you know that in Islam, Allah is only one God? And you'll go, no, really, I didn't know that. Tell me more. Uh, we have these loud conversations, like across to each other. But sometimes we, it almost sounds as fake as I'm doing it now, like, no, really, tell me more. And it, this is how it was in the beginning, and it looked staged. And everyone could, oh, okay, you guys are like, really, you're worse than the, the Mormons. So now we've got it to a more of a finer art. Like I say, sure, you know what, like we went to mosque the other day, so we got it more real. But before it was a bit fake, it was almost like, no, tell me more. <laughs> so we have to be careful. Do it, but you're going to have to just make sure it's natural. Don't read the text. Like, bring out your card and go, okay, next time. Yes, I did know. <laughs> so make it as genuine as possible. So writing and publication is very, very important. Make magazines because we forget that half, not half, a lot more than half don't have the internet yet. A lot of countries, they're still putting coal into the internet to get it going. That's how slow it is. It's like an old coal engine. Some countries don't even know what an internet is. Do you know how to break the internet? This is jokes for home. It's probably an old one. You type Google into Google, and then the internet will break. I told my brother this, and he believed me. So <laughs> there are many people who are ignorant about the internet. They don't know that the internet is actually the internet. They, they think it's something else, you know? So I don't believe everybody knows internet. That's the only way to do it. So use publications. But with any publications, if you're going to do it, do it properly. Don't do it in that cheap paper. I mean, who's going to want to read that? So that's why you'll see them in the mosque, and they're that much when you went into the mosque, and there's that much next week. No one's taken one. But if you put a nice, glossy, good quality copy there, they're all gone because that, it attracts them. So it's very, very important to have a decent quality. If you don't have the budget for it, that's fine. Bring out less. You don't have to print 50,000 copies. You just bring out 50 then. But rather have quality over the quantity. Um, you want people to actually keep these documents and, and read them. Use very catchy titles. Mine are all crazy titles. There's nothing that has a normal title on it. Like one of my titles or my favorite one is called Eat More Chicken. That's the title, my Dawa publication. It's got like a picture. And it's got like a chicken, a cow holding up a, a sign saying, eat more chicken. So a lot of people go, what has that got to do with Islam? Because in it, it talks about issues of health. It talks about how Christians talked about Jesus saying, this is my body, this is my blood. So it deals with lots of things to do with meat and food and everything from a biblical and Islamic perspective. So you want to have catchy titles instead of saying halal and haram meat. No one's going to pick that up. So you want to have things that are going to grab attention to the people. Whatever catchy title, obviously you've got to be careful what you put in there. Like there, there are a lot of very, very simple ways that you can do dawah through publications. Try to have good quality covers. Cover is everything. They say don't judge a book by its cover. Everybody judges a book by its cover. If they didn't judge a book by its cover, there wouldn't be so much money spent on sales, on research, on what you must put on your cover. So a book is sold by its cover. No one's interested in what's inside the book. They're interested in what's on the front cover and who is on the back cover. So if your front cover is nice and bold and your back cover has got famous people on it that said this is a good publication, then people will take it or pick it up or buy it or walk away with it. If your back cover has nothing on it, it's just a blank page telling about how great you are as a person with a picture of yourself, no one's going to take it. So try to have some famous people on the back cover, like Yusuf Estes, people like, you know, well-known celebrities for whatever field they are in. Put those, their little picture, with, like this book is a good book, get them to, or good magazine, whatever, have that on your back cover. The worst is when you have a back cover and it's your photographs, we're telling about how great you are as a person. I think that is just, I mean, it's not necessary, you wrote the book, that shows that you're a good person anyway. But rather have somebody else talking about the book or the magazine or whatever it is. So front cover, back cover, extremely important. Don't forget the importance of publications. When writing publications, you can do it at home. You don't need big organizations to do it. You can do it at home. I started a newsletter when I was still in school, and I used to distribute it about, about 100 people. So I started young with, like, newsletters. So you can do that at home. Start with a small newsletter you just distribute amongst 100 people. 
and then you can go on and build up from there. That's all the time we have for this week. You're going to have to join us again next week, same place, same time, as we continue with our investigation of Dawah Illallah. So for more or less, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. Discussion, 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 debate, debate, debate. Rebuttal, rebuttal, rebuttal. Conclusion, conclusion. Eliminate misconceptions about religion. Get enlightened. Witness Dr. Zakir Naik in a battle of words in Crossfire every Saturday at 8.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12.30 p.m. UK on Peace TV. Images, images and, depictions and depictions of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have spread around the globe. May endless blessings be upon thee. His life is being examined in the glare of the global media spotlight. It is the duty of every Muslim, every Muslim to present to the world the truth of his life and the excellence of his character. And we have not sent you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy to the universe. To do this, you have to know your prophet. It's something that you simply can't afford to be ignorant of. Allah, send your peace on your slave.